Good morning. It is Friday. Woohoo! I'm just uh, snuffly. The something blooming in this world that's giving my eyeballs problems and my face problems. So forgive me if I start snuffling in the middle of this uh, this conversation with you. I hope you're well. It is a beautiful day. Cold. We actually have the heat on. I don't know if you can hear it there, but the heat's running because it was down quite chilly this morning. Can't believe that after the earlier part of the week. But uh, it is a beautiful day, and it is the day that the Lord has made. So we will rejoice uh, and be glad in it. I hope that your day is going well. And Sausage has decided to join me today. It's that beautiful of a day. Did you want to say hello, Sausage? No, he says I'm in his chair. That's really what this is about. It's his chair. I'm borrowing it. So this morning, let's take some time and talk about God's Word. So I'm really excited today to move to chapter 56 of Isaiah. And if you'll notice, we've kind of hit the nearing the end of the book of Isaiah. And as we hit the end of the book, it gets into really big picture, big promise, big plan stuff. And remember, this is Isaiah writing for the people who are returning from exile. And more than that, really, because he's writing about God's can for, plan for his kingdom. He's telling them what the kingdom of God will look like when God makes it happen in that beautiful way. And we saw last week that all that was fulfilled in Jesus, in the yesterday and the day before. And we're constantly finding that Isaiah's proclamations and portents point us not only to the return of Israel from exile, but to Jesus' coming and ending the true exile between God and man. So 56 is none the different. It continues with this idea of who Jesus is and what his kingdom will look like. Uh, as Isaiah writes it, you can imagine him just getting so excited about the promises of God as he says, God, really, this is your plan? This is so much bigger than I could have ever thought. And that's what it is. It's so big. I, 56 opens our eyes to really see what it means when God says he's inviting the whole nations in. So we're not going to read the whole of chapter 56. I'm just thinking I'm going to read till that chapter to verse 8. So let's read this together. And uh, Sausage, do you want to say hello? Sausage is licking my hand. So I assume that means that he wants to say hello to you. This is Sausage. Sausage also has allergy problems, as you can see from the brown stuff around his eyes. And he says, Dad, this is embarrassing. Well, Court's not here to embarrass, so I get to embarrass you. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's read some Bible. Isaiah 56, 1. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness will be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, Surely the Lord will separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give my house, give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to, the love, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast to my covenant, these I will bring my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, declares, I will gather yet others unto him, besides those already gathered. Woo! You might not get how exciting that is. It is exciting. First off, in Deuteronomy 23, um, I read that before we started talking. That's how I can remember it. God says that uh, foreigners and eunuchs can't come into the presence of God that they're strictly outlawed and pushed outside of the temple. In fact, a continuation of that kind of the spirit of that command of the, the purity of God, that God was for a people that were set apart, which was the reason he said that, was a reminder to the people of, um, was the reason that the people of Israel in Jesus' time 
didn't really treat the court of prayer for the Gentiles with much respect. It was because, well, you know, they can't go in the presence of God anyways. What do they want to have to do with us? But God is saying something huge here. He's saying that in his kingdom, and notice those first words. He says, um, uh, soon my salvation will come and my righteousness will be revealed. Um, he says that when it comes, when his kingdom comes, eunuchs, those who have been physically scarred in such a way that they can no longer have children, that they are, they were, you know, um, considered unwhole in as humans. God says they will have a place and they will have a name and I will even give them a, um, oh, what's the word that he uses there? It's a great word for that, isn't it? Um, I will give you a monument and a name better than sons and daughters that shall not be cut off. And so instead of being those that would be forgotten because they could have no children, God says that in my kingdom, you'll find a meaning and a purpose and you will be remembered. And then he goes on and he turns to the foreigners and he says, bring your sacrifices, bring your um, offerings to be accepted because my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Now, this is huge because the Lord just lifts up his eyes and he lifts up Isaiah's eyes to see when you think of my kingdom, you can stop thinking about Jerusalem and Zion and Judah as being a Jewish affair. The kingdom that I'm bringing in is a fulfillment of the Abrahamic prophecy that all God, all nations will be blessed through Abraham's seed. And that's what we have in Christ, is in Christ, all nations of the world are blessed. Jesus, the son of Abraham, the son of David, um, the son of Joseph, the son of Mary, the son of God who came and lived and died and redeems us all, uh, becomes a king who rules over a nation that is without end and uh, any can turn and can trust in him. And of course, that was a big part of what happened in the New Testament is Peter sees the vision that God says it's time for the Gentiles to come in. Peter takes it back to the uh, apostles and the apostles don't think that Peter's crazy because of passages like this one. So they get the idea that Peter not only isn't crazy, this is joyful news because at last, this is the kingdom of God happening. And look at verse 8. He says, The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, Yet I will gather others to him besides those already gathered. That's powerful that to him, of course, so we as Christians hear that and we think we'll get, he'll gather others to Christ despite, despite those he has already gathered. In John 6, Jesus says that as well, that there are those from elsewhere that will come in and God is going to give to me as well. I think he says that again in John like 13 or 14 during the, during the, the, the conversation in the room uh, before he's uh, crucified. So uh, the Last Supper, during the meal in the Last Supper. So all that to say, uh, we have this huge and expansive picture where those that were considered outside the kingdom of God are being brought in. And I think this correlates really well with what we talked about last week about grace, or yesterday about grace, because when you think about it, when um, everybody kind of, if you're from, a, if you're in a new place, if you want to be part of a group that you're not part of, you, you stand on the outside and you look in and you think, wow, wouldn't it be fun to be part of that? Um, but for whatever reason, I can't. And you come up with your excuse, or maybe it's true, because like I couldn't play basketball, so I don't... Uh, pretend or hockey really can't play hockey so let's be Canadian there's no way I could play hockey I could look at it and think man it would be fun to be part of a hockey team but uh, no I just wouldn't uh, I couldn't so I wouldn't but if by some divine means of grace my character was changed such that the idea of being part of that team and more than that character my abilities were transformed such that I could actually ice skate and use a stick in my hand while I'm ice skating without falling on my face, then that's the kind of grace that's transformative that could, I could possibly part of, be part of a hockey team. Now, weird and maybe not the best analogy, but what God is saying is that anyone who looks to him, any of the outcasts of the world who feel outside, see him and turn to him and look to him, they're welcomed in. They are brought into this beautiful family of God, to, to Jesus. And it's in when we look to Jesus that we are renamed, renewed, and our character is changed, our hearts are changed, such that um, 
we can be called his people and be known uh, by him. So it also changes our future, which is really cool. So that's kind of a, a reflection on this passage. Read it again if you want. Think about it, what it means for you. But it certainly means that we need to be careful as a church um, about thinking about who belongs. It's not so much looking for those people who look like they belong in church as looking for those people who uh, look like they would enjoy being part of the people who love them. And if we're not the kind of people who love people, who would welcome people in, who people who are looking for that welcome, that connection, maybe it's something that our church needs to change as well. So there's the passage. Let's pray. Father, we thank you on this glorious day for your glorious word. We thank you for the vision that Isaiah was given for the kingdom of God coming in. Now we thank you that you were pl planning this from the time of Abraham so that when the New Testament happened, when the church began to form, it was no surprise. It was the fulfillment of the prophet, the work of the prophets of old as they spoke of the glory of God and his plan for his kingdom. And we are that fulfillment today. We are living in the future, literally, and we praise you for that, Father. Help us to live not in the past, but in the future, living for the who you have made us to be, for the character that you have given us, um, that we would put aside the old self, the dead self, the sinful self, the flesh that hungers and thirsts for anything that isn't righteousness, but we would fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, faith. and for the joy set be who for the joy set before him endured the cross, going in shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. May we follow him earnestly, delighting in the work that he has done on our behalf and the work that he is doing in us and through us to build his kingdom and better it today. May we be light and life to those we meet. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Friends, thank you for joining me. I hope that you have a beautiful day and a wonderful weekend. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye-bye.